and clients who are dying and grieving. This is it. Delirium. So what is delirium? It's an acute, which is key. It is acute medical condition due to a medical condition. It can present itself during the withdrawal from a substance, or it could be due to multiple causes. Or sometimes it could be not otherwise specified, like not quite sure what is the cause of this delirium. It is generally reversible if the underlying cause is discovered and treated, but if untreated, it can lead to death. So those are the important things. Acute, reversible. Has anyone ever encountered anyone who's delirious? Are you guys there? You guys hearing me? Oh, yes, you're there. Okay, let me turn this up a little. Okay, so some people have even experienced delirium themselves. It is weird. I, I'm also in school myself and I was talking to my professor there, they were talking about how education has changed. And I said to her, this is like my biggest struggle, talking to my computer. It is the weirdest thing ever. I mean, you guys are looking at me, but I'm looking at no one. And then I'm talking, I'm like, I can't read faces. I can't get any cues. Like, it has been a challenge teaching online since COVID, especially when there are no faces to look at. But we'll get through this. So delirium. It's an altered state of consciousness and it has significant, it can cause significant deficits in one's cognition. Usually rapid levels of consciousness, consciousness are fluctuating. This patient can be confused, especially at nighttime in the hospital. So this is the patient you'd probably have to work at reorienting, reminding them what time it is. I mean, even you and I, if we were in the hospital, locked in day in, day out, Sometimes we'll probably lose track of what day it is or even what time of day it is. Their recent memory will be impaired more so. They'll be unable to focus or follow directions. Their speech will be incoherent. They can have dysomia or aphasia, which is the inability to express speech. As a psych, Nurse practitioner, I don't encounter these disorders as much, but as a nurse, I did, and as a nurse, you will, as you work on different units. What are some predisposing factors to delirium? Post-op, a patient who's post-op, a patient who was hospitalized also under having constant pain, a patient who's using sedative drugs. Remember, we said it can be as a result of ingesting a substance. So if you're using sedative drugs for habituates, steroids, those subject to continuous noise or irritation, having interferences with their oxygen level, glucose, or having sensory overload. Those are the patients who are predisposed to delirium. Also the elderly, usually caused by medications or if they're dehydrated, I was just about to say UT. I remember way back in LPN school, and I never forgot if an older patient starts acting a different from their baseline, check for a UTI. That's one thing I definitely learned. If they're immobile, also if they have dementia, they can have delirium. So when, when a patient is delirious, their insight, their judgment, that's impaired. So their judgment is impaired. So that is a cue for us to be keen on safety. This is not the patient who's going to reason through effectively to know they if they cross the street, there'll be danger or 
using sharp objects because they have impaired judgment and insight. So as nursing, we have to make sure we provide a safe environment. We want to make sure we are assessing their safety if they're having delirium. They will engage in continuous aimless activity, walking around, talking, um, gibberish nonstop. So you got to make sure, again, you provide safety for this patient. They have an increased risk for falls. Again, safety. Sleep is always disturbed in a patient who's delirious with an abnormal EEG. The cause is not psychologically based. Again, due to a general medical condition, could be medication or substance or a combination of these factors that can cause a, pa a patient to be delirious. Then we have dementia. This is characterized by a patient having multiple cognitive deficits that include memory impairment. There can be dementia of the Alzheimer's type, vascular dementia. It could be due to a medical condition, the inducing induction of a substance, inducing a substance, or from HIV, a TBI, Creon's disease, Parkinson's, Huntington's, Korea, Crustful Jacobs or encephalitis. So again, there are several reasons that can cause a patient to be demented. A patient who has dementia will have multiple cognitive deficits caused by primary brain pathology. It could be slow. I'm, so, I'm sorry, it is slow, progressive, and irreversible. So the opposite of delirium, it is not acute or quick onset, it is slow, it is progressive, and it is reversible in most cases. Pseudodementia. This is a condition caused by another psychiatric disorder that mimics dementia. That's why it's called pseudo. So it's not quite dementia, it kind of looks like dementia. Remember when we spoke about the different mental health disorders and as we went through the symptomology sometimes you realize that some of the symptoms could present as something else so if the patient's um, symptomology was such that it resembled dementia but the cause of it was through the mental health disorder then we could title it as pseudo dementia a patient could have amnesic disorders where they have memory impairment, which can be caused by a general medical condition or as a consequence of a persistent effects of a substance use. They smoke some weed, can't remember them, um, some stuff. It could be a general medical, medical condition that impairs their judgment and reasoning as well. If you're interviewing, I remember this is something that was on my boards. If you're interviewing a patient who has delirium, versus a patient who has dementia. The delirious patient will be unable to answer the questions. They'll be confused, they'll be frightened, they'll be angry. While the patient who has dementia, they will try to answer. They will be unconcerned with making, unconcerned with making mistakes. If they have depression or pseudo dementia, they will not try to answer and rather they will say, I don't know. So there are lots, the next slide goes over the lots of different types of dementia and the percentage in, in popularity. Parkinson's, Picks, Huntington's, Crutchfield, Jacobs, Lewy body, Down syndrome and progressive Spinicular palsy. There are some dementias which are, of course, irreversible. I'm sorry, reversible, such as those where we can find the causes, such as a vitamin B12 deficiency. Then you infuse um, vitamin B12 to m make them no longer deficient. If the person is depressed, like in older adults, we seek to treat the depressive symptoms. 
alcoholism, we remove the substance. If it's potassium lost from Persian, then we replace the potassium or nutrition base, whether it's by tube feeding or different feeding principles, we seek to increase their nutrition as well. A patient with dementia will have multiple cognitive deficits or defects, but there must be memory impairment included in those cognitive deficits to be labeled as amnesia, as dementia. Then we have amnesia, amnesic disorders. These are due to a general medical condition. It could be a substance induced. It could also be from toxins or medication side effects or sometimes it can be unspecified. It is characterized by an impaired memory in the absence of other significant accompanying cognitive impairments. So impaired memory along with other cognitive deficits, such as unable to learn new information or recall information that was previously learned. The memory disturbance may be transient or it can be chronic. There's impairment in social and occupational functioning. And there's evidence that this condition is due to consequences of general medical conditions, substance use, or toxins or exposures. So you're working in the ER, working on the floor, patient comes in, they can't remember who they are, can't remember their name or how they even got there. It is important to remember that it can be caused by several different causes. You wanna rule out the different causes to determine what happened and how you can effectively treat this patient. You have dementia of the Alzheimer's type. Can be caused by angiopathy of the blood-brain barrier, starting in the hippocampus, which leads to memory impairment. It can be deficiencies in the neurotransmitters, such as decreased acetylcholine, which leads to memory and cognition impairment. This patient can also have abnormal brain proteins. the B amyloid, the proteins, the neurofibrillary tangles. It could be genetic defects. They could be simply just born that way. Dementia of the Alzheimer's type, important to note, patients often die within 10 years after their first diagnosis. Dementia of the Alzheimer's type, it occurs in different stages. It could be mild, it could be moderate, or severe. A patient who has a dementia of the Alzheimer's type in stage one, they will have slight changes in their personality. They will lose some cognitive functions as it relates to communication, calculating, recognizing faces. They'll have recent memory loss. They'll have mild behavior problems. Their sensor and motor function will remain intact. Their sleep will be normal. They will be aware of the changes. So this is the patient who is able to reason through and realize that I don't remember things like I used to. I can't count like I used to. My personality has changed a little. And as they become more self-aware of the changes that are happening to their lives, they will start. Ex they can start experiencing depression. And in experiencing depression, they start using defense mechanisms, the denial, the repression the projection or the rationalizing. Oh, it's my age, I'm just getting old. Could be. Yes, they can start to confabulate. What would that be? So we used confabulation when we spoke about schizophrenia. And if it's, it's, it's mentioned here that the patient with dementia also confabulates, what would, the, what would they be doing here? Would it be like projection? No, as it relates to confabulation. Okay. No longer a defense mechanism. This is something that schizophrenic patients do in their speech they confabulate. So as they're talking, 
it is not intentional, but they, yes, Michael, they make up. Remember, I usually give you little cues, confabulate, fabricate. So they make up things. So they, as they tell their stories, they start filling in with made up stories and that's confabulation. They can also begin to self grieve because they realize that they're losing their faculties, losing their function, their quality of life has changed, their function has changed, and it's a big life change and often difficult for one to accept and work through effectively. I can't imagine when the day comes when I realize I can't do what I do now, I'll be, I will definitely be mourning that loss. As the disease progresses, they can go into moderate, which they will have further cognitive decline. They can be paranoid and increase in amnesia. So if you have a patient who has cognitive issues, they are paranoid, they have difficulties with speech, they're having perseveration, and we said perseveration was what? This is another characteristic of a schizophrenic patient. They perseverate. Yes, they say things over and over. They repeat things. Yes, they perseverate on things. So, correct, guys. So, if a patient is having cognitive issues, they're paranoid, they're perseveration, what could you confuse your symptoms to be? Schizophrenia, right? You could probably think it's schizophrenia. So, this is why it's important to make sure whatever is presenting that we're teasing out things effectively so we're not leaving a patient who has dementia, has been schizophrenic. And this is why we get history from family members and different things so we can effectively reason through what's going on. They could start pacing, wandering about, have difficulties in making decisions, or have a decrease in all executive functions. They'll have an increase in behavioral problems. Then we have sundowning. Have you guys heard the term sundowning? What happens at sundowning? They get more confused. Yes. So they start having the sundowning. They can have catastrophic reactions and more behaviors as well at that time. So it could be something small and their response is greatly out of proportion to what has happened. They could start having some aggression sleeplessness, refusing food, hydration, become deficient in their self-care, poor sleep or sleep reversal, sleeping all day, up all night, no longer normal sleep pattern, poor judgment, and they begin to not be able to recognize their family members. So just imagine you've been afflicted with this disease or you're working on a dementia unit or stuff. It's, it's pretty important to know how these patients will present so you can adequately treat them. Then there's stage three, which is the severe. This patient will have a decrease in all self-care. They'll become dependent on others for total care. Communication is limited. They can have hyperthreatomorphous, where they start touching everything. Secondary illnesses start to develop from them just having decreased self-care, laying around more, such as choking, becoming cachectic or emaciated. They kind of have an obstructive bowel from their decreased physical activity, even pneumonia. I remember when I was going to nursing school, it was important to make sure patients are up and out of bed, up the chair, ambulating, and it's the water of these problems that can arise from simple interventions. They can even progress to vegetative state. And of course, there's some grief, not just within the patient. Well, at this point, they can't reason through what's going on, but for the family members to have watched their loved one decline to this, there's usually some grief.
your nursing assessment depend on others for history. So this is not the patient who's probably going to give you, this is when my symptoms started, this is what's happening, because remember, they have cognitive deficits. They're not able to remember and reason through your questions effectively. They will need a quiet environment without distractions. Assess your caregivers for caregiver role stress or their ability to care effectively for these patients. These patients will require a lot of attention, a lot of care. You're going to use your cognitive assessments tools, like your mini mental status exam. There's a dementia severity scale, a, ger a geriatric depression scale, a mini cog, or functional assessment staging tools. Have you guys ever heard of any of these assessment tools? Yes? Okay. A very common one is the mini mental status, and the mini cog is used pretty much. I'm pretty often as well. So wherever you go, this is why wherever you go, you have to familiarize yourself as to what assessment tools is being used and what they're used to measure so you can access and use them effectively. A patient is not presenting quite right. You're not sure if it's their cognition. Give them a mini cog. You think they may be depressed. There is a geriatric depression scale. So make sure you're aware of whatever the, the tools are. So when you call your provider to report as to what function is being the client. You can also back up your assessment with an assessment tool. Your physical assessment will include assessing for dehydration or decrease in nutrition, their risk for aspiration, incontinence, and the need to turn and change frequently, changes in their gait, safety, falls. I remember when I was in nursing school, we read an article and it's, I forgot how many months it was it exactly, but there was a research, a research that was done that showed after patients, elderly patients broke their hips. I think it was, I don't wanna give you false information, but I think I wanna say it was like a three month period um, from there that would start having a decline in health and ultimately death. But it, research has shown that once a patient breaks a hip, it is downhill from there. Even if they recover from the break, the broken hip, usually from the recovery period of laying around in bed, decreased mobility, usually takes a huge toll on their overall health. This is why to avoid these injuries in the first place is very, very important. They'll have changes in their sleep, changes in their bowels. This is where good nursing care is important to water off bed sores or illnesses that could have otherwise been avoided, like pneumonia, if they were doing up to cheer, ambulating, turning frequently, all those different nursing interventions. Safety, health risks is big. Injury, hygiene, feeding. As a patient experiences disturbance in the reception, and changes in your cognition, you start having anxiety, some amount of confusion. We should plan for some anticipatory grieving so we can help to work through and effectively communicate with this patient to comfort them as they go through their loss. There could be disturbances in their coping abilities. Caretakers could be strained. So um, do you need to suggest interventions? Do they need a home health aid? Do they need to go to a nursing home? Ex assess the family's coping as well. Assess for hopelessness. Is the treatment they're getting effective? Isn't it, is it managing their symptoms? So those are some interventions you can seek to explore to make sure you're working in the patient's best interest. Some ways to assure patient safety, if this is a patient who is wandering around, walking around aimlessly, one-to-one -one supervision, easy fix, or this is a patient who you can probably have doing an activity around the nurse's station so you, you can have eyes on if it is that you don't have the luxury of employing a one-to-one -one sitter. You want to protect them from their poor judgment. Keep doors to the outside closed. Make sure they're in an area where they can't wander off into somewhere unsafe. 
You want to keep them as mobile and independent as possible. So even though you know Mr. Brown wanders around, wanders around everywhere, this is not, you're not going to leave Mr. Brown in his bed with all the rails up. No, because then what's going to happen to him eventually? While it, it makes for a safer shift for you, it makes for not good health for Mr. Brown, because if he's laying in bed all day, then he's going to start developing other problems. So you want to make sure you keep them as independent as possible. If the patient can't manage to feed themselves, let them feed themselves. Use calm, reassuring, so a soft voice or a soft approach, which is what we mentioned earlier in the beginning. Empathize with the patient's feelings. Validate their feelings with words. Help to maintain your self-esteem and dignity. I remember when I was at LPNN, we did our clinicals in nursing homes. And I remember how much of an eye-opener it was when we saw those patients who had a picture of themselves younger in their rooms. Because you see them as an old person, and sometimes we forget because it becomes, it becomes work and it becomes normal. We forget that these are people and they are not the diabetic they're not the schizophrenic. These are men and women who have feelings, who have some amount of autonomy, and who sometimes, even if you think about understanding, sometimes they can effectively reason through what you're doing or hearing things you don't think they're hearing. So it's very important that we remember that therapeutic communication is always, always important. Even if the, even if the patient is delirious, you still speak to them with respect. You still assume that they can hear you. You still ask for permission before you rip their Johnny off. Respectfully use the patient's name and titles. So the honey and the sweetie are not appropriate ways to address our patients. They have names. Avoid negative responses to their failure. So if they tried at something and it didn't quite go as you had wanted it to be, then by all means make it um applaud them oh i'm so happy that you tried at least you made an effort so no matter how small you want to applaud their little trials or their big successes however it may be you want to provide simple choices this patient is already having cognitive issues so don't try to complicate their choices any further make simple choices maybe between two things structured and safe environments provide routines as I mentioned, praise their successes. Use simple, short phrases as you communicate. If they have a task to do, break it into small, doable activities. They have to get up, do their morning hygiene, probably go to a group, or whatever the activity is. Make sure you break it up so they don't become overwhelmed easily. Allow the patient safe time to himself. So don't um, structure the idea too much either where they can't have some downtime because that is also important. Make eye contact, speak in a, lo in a low voice, utilize name tags because very often they wouldn't know you from yesterday to today even though you, you identified yourself to them yesterday. Yellow police tape could be necessary for cordoning off areas that you don't want them to wander into or to use. And all of, this, all of those suggestions that I just stated are fall under one head in therapeutic communication. Different treatment modalities that these patients will need. They'll probably need some OT, some PT. There'll probably be a need to involve a social worker if it is that you need to get ad additional services for the patient if the family is struggling. Therapeutic activities, singing, music, card games, pictures, old old time skills, like stuff they used to do, knitting, anything they used to enjoy. I remember again when I used to do my clinicals in a nursing home as an LPN, my nursing instructor, he would have like the patients at the nurse's station and we would sing and they enjoy that totally. So engage them in activities. They will sometimes come alive with these simple things that you think nobody would be interested in. Medications to slow the progression and manage their symptoms can include trazodone. Trazodone is an antidepressant, but very often you'll see it being prescribed for, who knows? Sleep, yes, that is correct. So even though it's an antidepressant, more than likely, most of the times you see it, it's prescribed for sleep. 
there's risperidone and we know that risperidone is an antipsychotic. Why do you think a, a patient with dementia or delirium would be on antipsychotics? Antipsychotics help with their moods. Yes, if, they, if they're having delusions, running around the unit screaming, they're seeing things, hearing things. If they're combative and aggressive and irritable, antipsychotics often help with that as well. Ativan, why would they be taking Ativan, lorazepam? Anxiolytic, if they have anxiety. And what group, what class of drugs is Ativan from? Benzos. Is this a class of drugs that is often prescribed every day? Like to be taken every day? PRN. No. PRN. Yes, it's usually PRN. They could be taking Depakote which is an anticonvulsant, but is often used for aggressiveness. It's, it's often used for mood stabilization. Depakote is one of those drugs that you have to, that has parameters. It is um, like lithium, you need to do blood draws uh, for Depakote. The therapeutic range is between, I wanna say 50 and 125. So if a patient is on Depakote, you wanna make sure you're following the recommendation, the recommended parameters too keep that patient on the drug, which is the blood draws, chicken liver function, and stuff like that. When they say Depakote sprinkles, what does that mean? So it's the medication, but one that you can sprinkle. Yes, so you, so you can sprinkle me and you can put it on foods because remember, as the patients get older, very often they have a hard time swallowing so they have Depakote sprinkles. You're thinking less as in less dosages, like less dosage? I know. So the Depakote sprinkles is usually like, you know, a 125 milligram. So I guess if you wanted more, you just have to use more of it. But the sprinkle form just means you can sprinkle it, like add it to their food. So there are different treatment modalities for patients with these neurocognitive disorders. They could be in home. They could be in a daycare setting throughout the day because those caring for them have to work. It could be in the acute care setting, such as the hospitalized setting, residential care facilities, skilled nursing care facilities, or you can see them even in hospice. Neurocognitive disorders, it, it is important to determine. So sometimes I'll have patients and I'm not quite sure what is presenting to me. They are telling me they're forgetting things. Um, and it may may look like, may sound like dementia. So when that occurs, I'll often send the patients off to, to get a neuropsych evaluation to determine exactly what is presenting. Any questions regarding that? Okay, so now we get to the more Weirder stuff, or some would say the fun stuff, it's sex. So sexual disorders and gender identity issues. And you're wondering, how did this fall on the site, right? But as we go through the different things, you realize that's usually something going on in the person's head that usually leads to these things happening. So sexual dysfunction, this is characterized by a disturbance in the process that characterizes, that characterizes sexual, the sexual response cycle. 
or by pain associated with sexual intercourse. So there are four phases for the sexual response. Usually there's a desire. You start fantasizing about sexual activity and you have a desire to engage in sexual activity. This is followed by excitement. This phase consists of a subjective, well, as you think it is, sense of pleasure, of sexual pleasure, and the accompanying physiological changes. In males, there'll be an erection. In females, the vagina becomes lubricated. So that's the normal process. And then there comes an orgasm. This, is the, this phase consists of a peaking of sexual pleasure with release of sexual tension and rhythmic contractions of the perennial muscles and reproductive organs. In male, there's an ejaculation. In females, there are contractions of the wall of the outer third of the vagina. And in both genders, there's anal sphincter rhythmic contractions. So then there is the resolution. This is where everything relaxes and there's hopefully a general sense of well-being for both parties. The male is physiologically limited to further erections or an orgasm for variable periods. Some people, a few minutes, some people not for the rest of the day. It depends on who you are. In females, they may be able to respond to additional stimulation almost immediately. So a sexual disorder can occur at any phase, at any stage during these phases. So there could be a hyposexual desire disorder. This is the person who has a persistent or recurrently deficient or absent sexual fantasies and desire for sexual activity. So a deficient or absent sexual fantasies or desire. It causes them marked distress or interpersonal difficulties because they just don't desire sex. They have no, no feelings for intimacy. And of course, not better accounted for by any medical condition or any substance use. That's a hypoactive, and as the name states, it kind of explains it, hypoactive sexual desire disorder. Then we have a sexual aversion disorder. This is the persistent or recurrent extreme aversion to an avoidance of all sexual contact with a sexual partner. Again, it causes distress and not better accounted for by a substance or a medical condition. And you will find sometimes that patients with mental health disorders or, or patients with some personality disorders, they also have these sexual disorders. Like if we, th if we think of the schizotypical, the schizoid patient who has no desire for intimacy, no, no desire to engage in sexual activity. While they may have these, it wouldn't just be labeled a sexual aversion disorder, they would have had a schizotypal. So it cannot be accounted for by another mental health disorder, even though you can see these things in other patients with other diagnoses. There's the female sexual arousal disorder, persistent or recurrent inability to attain or maintain until completion of sexual activity and adequate amount of lubrication. So we can see how this can cause marked distress and interpersonal difficulties. So this patient could have some anxiety, some dysfunction in their life, and it could be stemming from their sexual issues. Male erectile disorder. And we know about this a lot because we see all those ads on TV. It's a persistent or recurrent inability to attain or maintain until completion of sexual activity and adequate direction. And of course, it causes distress and interpersonal difficulties. We also have the female orgasmic disorder. 
a delay or absence of orgasm following a normal sexual excitement phase. Of course, it can be based on age, one's sexual experience, or the adequacy of being aroused. So if you're not aroused enough, maybe this is why you're not having an orgasm, or maybe it's just not good, you're not having an orgasm. So it just depends on those factors as well. But for the person who have met all the other disclaimers and is still having issues, then they could be labeled as having a female orgasmic disorder. Then it could also be a male orgasmic disorder, a persistent or recurrent delay in or absence of an orgasm following a normal sexual excitement phase during sexual activity. Again, the age, it depends on the age. Then we have a premature ejaculation a persistent or recurrent ejaculation with minimal sexual stimulation before, on, or shortly after penetration and before the person wishes it. So of course we need to look at the age. Is this some young teenage boy who's this, it's his first time and he's just so excited and then oops? Or is it someone older and then you can look at it differently and it's not, oops, well, it could be, who knows? It could be, or it could be just some dysfunction with their sexual performance. Sometimes it could also be as a result of the novelty of the sex partner. Maybe it's someone who they've been fantasizing about, dreaming about, that causes this. Is it happening with every woman they encounter? Is it happening all the time? So there are lots of different factors to consider. And we can see how this can cause distress or interpersonal difficulties. So if this patient does engage with or is in a relationship with someone, it can cause relationship discord. There could be arguments, refusals, denials, like lots of things surrounding these sexual issues. This is the patient who will probably tell you, I'm not dating, I'm not interested in meeting anyone because they're having these issues. Then we have dyspareunia, which is painful intercourse. It's a recurrent or persistent genital pain associated with sexual intercourse in either a male or female. Without a doubt, it causes distress or interpersonal difficulties. And it's not, and this pain is not caused by vaginismus, which is like an in, a persistent involuntary spasms of the muscular outer third of the vagina. So this is not from the vagina having like muscular spasms or from not having enough lubrication. So it's lubricated. It's there are no spasms, but this pain, this person experiences a lot of pain during sex. And then we have vaginismus that I just I described the persistent involuntary spasms of the outer third of the vagina that interferes with sexual intercourse. So the normal sexual activity cannot occur because they're having these spasms. Sometimes patients can have these sexual dysfunctions and they can be due to a general medical condition such as MS, if they have spinal cord lesions, some neuropathy, temporal lobe conditions, endocrine conditions such as diabetes, hypothyroidism, dysfunctions in the pituitary gland, if they have vascular conditions, post-op like scarring. So there are lots of reasons that could account for patients having these dysfunctions. It could be caused by substance. Are they drinking too much alcohol, using drugs, amphetamines, cocaine, hypnotics, anxiolytics? So exploring the causes with, with patients and getting to the bottom of it is important. So to see if we can help them to alleviate these stressors in their lives. It could also be from prescribed medications such as those for hypertension or steroids. Then we have the paraphilias. Much of what I know about this is what I see like on CSI or some TV show. But there has there has been a few where I I have been ex, exposed to throughout my life. 
Exhibitionism. Over a period of at least six months, there's recurrent intense sexual arousing fantasies, sexual urges or behaviors, and an exposure of one's genitals to an unsuspecting stranger. Has anyone ever had any experience of this? And I'll take that as a no. Well, flashers, yes, Julie, flashers. Once upon a time, I was in a car with some girlfriends. It was Monday morning, we were heading to work. Stuck in traffic and I just, I'm sitting here minding my own business, you're in traffic, I'm in the back of the car, so I'm looking around. I was living in Jamaica then. I'm looking around and then I remember I looked and off on the side of the road, there was this guy who had his penis out and he was engaging in gross behavior on the side of the road. I mean, he was kind of off in the bushes, but let's just say it's been several years later and the image of seeing what I saw has never left my mind. So I hope none of you ever fall victim to an exhibitionist. I have a patient who we used to have really good um, sessions. He, he would interact appropriately and we'll talk and he'll talk about his life and things that are happening in his life until he was caught in a local library engaging in an exhibitionist behavior. And I don't know if it's, um, I don't know what it is, but since it happened, he has had court involvement. So he knows I'm aware of what happened. He has become very, almost like rude and aggressive to me, like in our sessions, like he doesn't want to talk to me anymore. And his answer is like, yes, no, I'm done. Are you done asking me questions? I'm still trying to put my finger on it as to why he would have assumed this new character with me. Is it shame? Is it guilt? I have no idea, but I do have a patient who's an exhibitionist as well. Then we have fetishism. This is over of, of, of at least six months. The, the person will have recurrent, intense sexual arousing fantasies, sexual urges or behaviors involving the use of non-living things. It could be female undergarments, shoes, etc. The fantasies, urges, or behaviors cause clinically significant distress. I had a new intake. I think it was like last week I did this intake and as we're talking about stressors in his life, he brought up his sexual interests as a stressor. And the interaction was an hour long and he kept going, he, he kept referring to it, but not talking about it directly. And I said, what is your sexual interest? And he goes, oh, I'm so ashamed to say it, but um, it's people who do food challenges. And I'm like, food challenges? Like, like, yeah, like people that eat like um like foot long hot dog or like lots of hamburgers and that's his fetish. I had a patient today that my assistant discovered had transferred to the male provider and I'm like, why did he transfer? He was my patient. Like I thought we had a good relationship because sometimes patients will transfer. So when I looked in his chart to try to figure out what I have so many patients, I don't even know how many patients I have. But if, if, if I've lost one patient, I would like to know what happened with that patient so I could either, one, try to make sure it doesn't happen with another patient, or two, um, do some self-reflection to see something I need to work on with myself. So I sought to try to find out why he had switched providers. And when I looked through his records, I realized that he had switched providers because he was having a porn addiction and he wasn't comfortable talking to me about it because I was female, so he asked to switch to the male provider. And sometimes I'll have patients switch to me um, from the male psychiatrist because they're having issues they don't want to discuss with the male person either. So as you work in the nursing world and you encounter these issues, make sure the patient is comfortable sharing them with you or find someone who they'll be more comfortable sharing these issues with as well. Then we have Frosherism, it's a period of at least six months where there's recurrent, intense sexual arousing fantasies, sexual urges or behaviors which involve touching and rubbing up against a non-consenting person. 
Has anyone ever had experience with any of it? Is either anyone rubbing up against them? Or anyone they know? Well, when I was living in Jamaica. So the public transportation in Jamaica, it's totally different from here. Like now I'll see the city buses, like everyone's seated, half the buses, more than half the buses empty most times I look into the bus and it runs on a schedule. I grew up in Jamaica where public transportation was, and I assume still is, the opposite of what we see here. The buses are usually filled to more than capacity. So you have everyone seated, all the seats are filled, and then you have people standing in the rows, you know, those bars that run down the walkway. So you'll have a group of people standing over here, like along this bar, holding on to the bar up there, and you'll have people standing on this way. So people standing on both sides of the walkway, holding on to the bars. And then, because public transportation is so horrible, you have people you'll have people standing behind those people. So you have like three rows of people standing in the, in the aisle of the bus. And I remember once I was in college and my friends and I we usually sit in the back and I was sitting in the back of the bus and there was this younger school girl. So if you're standing in the bus and someone's standing behind you, they have to like reach over you to hold on. So you, like if you're shorter, they'll be standing behind you. So it is a very unlucky day if you're standing there and a male chooses to come and stand behind you because he kind of has to touch you because you're here, he's here, and there's going to be someone else behind him here. And as as a young girl got off the bus, I heard a lot of uproar up in the front of the bus. So when I looked down and looked out the window, I could see the young girl's uniform. The man who was standing behind her had proceeded to rub up on her and ejaculated all over the back of her uniform. That is fraudulism. I had a girlfriend who was a teacher in Jamaica when I was living there as well and, I, and was teaching. And she shared with me that she was coming home for the Christmas holidays and there was a guy who was standing behind her and he was rubbing up against her. And she kind of pushed him off a few times. She pushed him off quite a few times. And then he proceeded to take a knife out and hold it to her side and told her not to move. And for the entire bus ride, that is how she rode. Can you imagine the trauma that would have followed if I know, I'm for sure if that was me, how that, that would have affected me? So unfortunately, a lot of people do experience these things and we don't know when it's gonna happen, where it's gonna happen, but it's good to be aware of it so we can address them when they do. Then we have pedophilia, which is quite common because we hear about it more. We, it appears to be occurring more. Some of the other ones, we don't hear about them, but it doesn't mean that they're not occurring. This is, this occurs over a period of at least six months where the, someone will have recurrent, intense sexual arousing fantasies sexual urges or behaviors which involves sexual activity with a prepubescent child or children. The person to be labeled as a pedophile, they would have acted on these urges. So they would have had these urges and they would have acted on them. These urges do cause them significant distress and interpersonal difficulties. Pedophilia, pretty common. I have quite a, a few patients who have been labeled as pedophiles. Then we have sexual macrochism. This is over a period of at least six months where the person has recurrent, intense sexual arousing fantasies, sexual urges or, be, or behaviors involved in the act of being humiliated, beaten, bound, or otherwise made to suffer. And I mean, these are the kind of things we'll see sometimes on crime shows that people engage in these behaviors. Or not just crime shows, but if you've watched any raunchy stuff, you'll probably see the kind of stuff too. And you're wondering why is it listed here? It's a deviation from the norm. Fifty Shades. I'm not that kind of girl. I hate those kind of movies. I'm into the horror, 
bloody gory stuff. But I have heard a lot of uproar about Fifty Shades, so I'm sure you'll find that kind of stuff in there. Sexual sadism. This happens over a period of, of at least six months, where the person will have recurrent, intense sexual arousing fantasies, sexual urges or behaviors involving acts in which the physiological or physical suffering and humiliation of the victim is sexually exciting to them. So a patient who a person who has a sexual sadism disorder, what activities do you think they may engage in? Yes, they could engage in that bondage behavior. Anything else? Involving acts in which the psychological or physical suffering and humiliation. Yes, yes. This is the patient who will probably be a rapist because they get their kicks from seeing someone humiliated or suffer. Then we have transvestic fetishism. Over a period of at least six months, of course, to be labeled as such. In a heterosexual male, there is recurrent, intense sexual arousing, fantasies, or sexual urges or behaviors, which involves cross-dressing. It's out there. They will cause clinically significant distress. And this is what often leads to the patients developing other issues because they're having a hard time dealing with their fetishes or their compulsions to do these things. Then we have voyeurism, also a little bit more publicized. Recurrent intense sexual arousing fantasies, sexual urges or behaviors involving the act of observing or an unsuspecting person who is naked or in the process of disrobing or engaging in sexual activities. I mean, ever so often you hear them arresting someone who was caught in some store changing room with a camera watching women of some sort. So this person has a disorder of voyeurism. Then we have gender dysmorphic disorder. This is the patient who has strong and persistent cross gender identification. In children, it's manifested by four of the following. They can have repeated stated desire for cross dressing or, an in, or insist that he or she is the opposite sex. In boys, they have a preference for cross-dressing or stimulating female attire, or simulating female attire, rather. In girls, they have an insistence on wearing only stereotypical male clothing. And this has become pretty common, and, and that is why when I do my intakes, I will ask, especially my, um, my adolescents, you're female because usually when you're older um, you're free to choose and you will act as you choose but sometimes when you're young they're hiding these things or they don't want to share them with their parents or anyone else and i'll ask you're female do you identify as female and i must say i've been totally schooled sometimes when i hear no i'm non-binary or i'm this i'm like wow kids these days are very knowledgeable there's a strong persistence for cross-sex roles, even in make-believe play, or even as they fantasize about being the opposite sex. They often will try to engage in the stereotypical games and activities or pastimes that that opposite sex would engage in as well. How how will this manifest? The adolescent will often state a desire to be the opposite sex. Very frequently they leave even pass as the opposite sex. They start dressing, cut their hair or let their hair grow, whatever the case, to pass as the opposite sex. They have the desire to live, be treated as the opposite sex, or have the conviction that he or she has the typical feelings and reactions of the opposite sex. 
they'll be persistently just uncomfortable with themselves as, as, as it is and become preoccupied with getting rid of the primary and secondary characteristics of their present sex. It'll cause clinically significant distress. And, I've, and from experience, I can say in the adolescent population, you'll see a lot of these patients with depression, with anxiety, and engaging in a lot of different behaviors because they just don't feel that they can be who they are. And they feel like they're always suppressing this part of them. And it leads to, and it manifests itself in other ways, sometimes even acting out behaviors because they can't fully be who they want to be. So we have one section to go. Would you guys like to take a break or would you just want to plow through? <laughs> of course, push the plow through, which either way. So we're going to look at clients who are dying or grieving. And this is where we will end your psych content. So as we go through life, there are different types of loss. Some loss is necessary, it's anticipated, it can be a part of the life cycle. So what losses do you think you can you, you could label as necessary losses? Yes, because we have to grow up, we have to have life experiences and we, and we lose that. Some could be actual, such as those of the loss of a valued person or item. It could be perceived. Pets, loss of a pet. What, are, what could be a perceived loss? What is a loss that a patient could have or someone could have that is not obvious to others, but it's, and for them, they can perceive this as being a loss. Yes and yes, loss of themselves, like as it relates to like delirium or dementia, loss of opportunities. I am a mother and as my children age, I have already begun to mourn the loss of being, like as they grow, I realize they need me less. And it, it would be good to have them as independent adults, but as the mother, I'm already grieving the loss of not having my young kids who, who would want to come and hug and nurture and mommy, mommy, mommy. So that's a loss I am going through as a parent as, as they mature. And I'm learning to adjust and deal with and realizing that they're young adults and they have own opinions and want to do their own things. Not quite there yet, Michael, but I guess one day I will be getting there when I realize that the house is empty. Yes, it could be through like breast cancer, losing their breasts. Like um, you as a nurse would probably, oh, you had breast cancer. It must be so good that you have cut those breasts off and you no longer have cancer. And while this patient is in themselves mourning that loss, it's a change in body image. It's a change in who they are. It could also be a maturational loss, which is like the loss I, I mentioned. It, it, it could be kids growing up, going off to college to emptiness, or it could be situational, such as something that's, not planned for or related to some external event. The next slide has the definition of terms, and I'll let you read through those. There's grief, mourning, bereavement, palliative care, hospice, postmortem care, living will, advanced directives, dual power of attorney, and informed consent. And these are all terms I'm sure you're all familiar with. So when a patient en encounters loss, there's a Kubler-Ross's stages of grief where it said they go through denial. And it is not always in this order, but it could be. There's some denial. Oh no, this is not happening, not at all. It could be some anger. Why me? What did I do to deserve this? Why not somebody else? Bargaining. 
God, if you let me get through this, I promise you that I will do that. Depression. They just can't reason through it effectively, but it is just too much for them to handle. They slip into a depressive state. Or acceptance. You know what? This is just my faith. And I'll just have to live through this. And as I mentioned, it's not necessarily in that order. And it will vary from person to person as it relates to how long they dwell in each stage or the intensity of each stage. And what are some factors that could play into how the patient works through these different stages of grief and loss? Thank you, you learned something this semester. Support system, their reasoning abilities, their coping mechanism, their experience, their education. So lots and lots of different things play into how they will effectively work through these losses. Mourning. Patient will encounter or enter into mourning once they have accepted the reality of the loss. They will experience emotional pain. They will change the environment to accommodate to the loss. They will keep meaningful relationships with the past while learning to go forward with love and life. And this doesn't always happen. These are the tasks of mourning. Sometimes you have some, um, some patients who have a, a, a very difficult time progressing through these tasks. I have one patient who lost her husband over a year ago and she still is grieving as if it just happened last week and who am i to say you should not be grieving this way because it's how she perceives this loss she she says she'll never date again she'll never marry again that was her soulmate and it is a very very difficult thing for her to reason through she's now in grief counseling and she's been in grief counseling for for a long time but it's going to take her some time or it might never be something she works through effectively and again, some things that play into how one grieves, stage of development, your age, your gender, your previous experience with grief. What if you grew up in a world where you saw death all the time? Then this is just another death for you. There could be interpersonal, it could be your interpersonal relationships, how you communicate your feelings, your personalities, your support system, your family, your friends, your community. Your cultural or ethnicity. Your social acceptability of the cause of death. Because sometimes culturally people mourn differently. Your spiritual beliefs. Your socioeconomic status, your financial situation. How is this going to affect you? Is this affecting you directly? Has it changed who you are? And your dysfunctional risk, which is your ability to cope. Types of grief, there's normal grief. This is the ability to move towards acceptance of the loss. The loss happens, you accept it and you can move forward. There's anticipatory grief, which could be like from a significant diagnosis that leads to a decline in one's health. You know, you're going to change. You know, you're going downhill. You go to the doctor until you have a month or two months to live. There is dysfunctional grief. It can be severe. It will impair your ability to function. Um, you could start engaging in self-destructive behaviors, have a low self-esteem, having suicidal thoughts, guilt, anger. Then there's the disenfranchised grief, which is more so ambiguous. This is when someone ex experiences loss not acknowledged by others. For example, loss of an ex-spouse, because you could be going through this divorce and everybody think it's like, oh, it's so good that you got out of that not so good relationship. But deep down, you're mourning that loss that nobody else realizes you're mourning. 
It could be someone with dementia, as we mentioned before, who's mourning the loss of what was, who they once were, but it is a grief that you can't, someone on the outside doesn't see or perceive. Then we have the inhibited, inhibited grief. This doesn't show outwards, typically. Signs are often more discreet and the patient will choose to keep this grief hidden, such as problems with physical malfunctions or manifestations, such as some of the things that we saw, like with the sexual dysfunctions. How many patients do you come, think will come out and share right away that, hey, I'm having some sexual erectile dysfunction over here? Very unlikely. So your nursing interventions, you want to facilitate mourning with the patient and the family. You want to be sure to promote continuity of care. If the patient is in, in your care and you're grieving something, you want to make sure you have you connect them with the appropriate resources, whether it be therapy or someone for meds or whatever the intervention may be. You want to make sure you're planning for their discharge. You're going to aid the patient with their physical care because if the patient is, is grieving, probably they're also experiencing some depressive symptoms and not paying attention to ADLs, eating and stuff. So you want to make sure you are helping to take care of them physically. Assist them with developing coping mechanisms and the emotional care of both the patient and your family. Be empathetic, be supportive. Advocate for other supports in the community and make sure you do some self-care. If it is that you work on a unit, patient has died, you can be grieving the loss of that patient too. It's not because it's work means you're going to make yourself totally detached from work where death just becomes another day at work for you. I remember one thing I learned, and, I, and over these years I have never forgotten it. It was from my teacher in LPN school. And she said to us, don't you ever be so busy on your shift where you know a patient is dying and you let that patient die alone. She said, no patient should die alone. She said, take your work with you, go sit at that patient's bedside and be there with them. And I'm gonna pass that on to you. Never be so busy to lose sight of the human or the care inside of nursing. Any question about tonight's content? I guess you guys are understanding the content. It's easy. Well, I'm glad. It was very informative and interesting. Yes. Mental health in general. Yes, it is. It is. Either you love it or you don't. <laughs> But it is very interesting. Anyone interested in some Kahoot? If you are, then you can stay on. And if you're not, then so long, farewell. I have a question. Yes. You said something about posting um, um, stuff for the exam. Where did you post it? I didn't post it. I read it last week. Oh, okay. Never mind. I have that part. <laughs> okay. And everybody okay. got that last week? Yeah, I have all the stuff that was last week. I thought you added something. Maybe. Okay, no. thank you. 